It's today again, so let's talk about the news. Starting with, we need to talk about Monday's horrific mass shooting at the Covenant School in Nashville, Tennessee, because among other things, we now have a more detailed timeline of what exactly happened. Beginning with a message the shooter reportedly sent to a childhood friend on Instagram at 9.57 a.m. announcing their intent to commit suicide, with the friend reportedly trying to comfort the shooter and even reaching out to a suicide prevention hotline, but it was too late, because by 10.13, the shooter had broken a side window at the school and crawled inside, prompting the first 911 call. With the officers then arriving at the scene at 10.24, body camera footage showing five of them clearly clearing the first floor, hearing gunshots upstairs, and then moving up to confront the shooter. But then finally, at 10.27, 14 minutes after the first call, and just a few minutes after entering the school, officers killed the shooter. With the police response here instantly being contrasted to the complete failure at Uvalde, where nearly 400 officers stood around for over an hour while kids were bleeding to death inside, which is why we're seeing the cops this week being lauded as heroes. Though heartbreakingly, even though they took swift action, there were six victims. Six, who we now know included three nine-year-old students and three adults, a teacher, a custodian, and the head of the school. And as for the shooter, we now now know they were a 28-year-old former student at Covenant and that the police chief said that they were under a doctor's care for an emotional disorder, adding that they legally purchased seven firearms from five different local gun stores, three of which they used in the massacre. While the official motive is currently unknown, detectives suggested that there may have been some resentment at having to attend that school, the police saying they're looking into a manifesto the shooter left behind, which includes a detailed hand-drawn map of the school. One of the most explosive and attached onto details that's come out of all this is the shooter apparently self-identified as transgender, with the police saying media initially identified them as female, but in fact, they used he, him pronouns. But the fact that the shooter is trans has divided people. Some saying this is business as usual, which is all, that just, that sentence is heartbreaking, that this is so normal and standard in the United States. We're like, yes, it's yet another shooting. It's the guns, it's the problem. Then on the other side, you have people saying, no, this is a mental health and trans problem. With the likes of Donald Trump Jr. lamenting the quote, incredible rise of trans non-binary mass shooters in the last few years. Charlie Kirk saying, instead of banning assault rifles, we should ban gender affirming care for kids. As well as Marjorie Taylor Greene and Laura Ingram suggesting hormones or medication for mental illness were factors. Though officially, we have no info on what drugs the shooter was taking. Green also ended up actually getting suspended by Twitter for claiming Antifa was organizing a trans day of vengeance, which I mean is one of the biggest talking points we've seen from a lot of those people, that this is a trans shooter targeting a Christian school. With the hashtag trans terrorism even trending on Twitter. And Tucker Carlson taking the you versus them nastiness to the absolute extreme. The trans movement is the mirror image of Christianity and therefore its natural enemy. The trans movement is targeting Christians, including with violence. So on that specific note, you had people saying the anti-trans discrimination does not help the matter. People pointing to depression, anxiety, PTSD, and suicidality that trans people frequently suffer due to a lack of acceptance from family and society, as well as one source telling the Daily Mail that the shooter was reportedly at odds with his devout Christian parents. But then you have others arguing that the fact that this is a trans shooter is a distraction, saying this is a gun issue. With a number of people, including the likes of political commentator Hassan Piker, tweeting, over the past five years, 2,840 plus mass shootings have occurred in the U.S. Three of those shooters have been trans. Guns are the number one killer of children, one to 18, and the writer salivating over a school shooter being trans to deflect away from the main issue, ease of access to weapons. As well as one clinician adding, when hundreds of white men commit mass shootings, it's a societal problem, but when one trans person commits a mass shooting, it's a trans problem. The actual problem is that this country is unable to do anything at all to stop gun violence. Which I mean, regarding that, the, the laws, the policy, politicians. Democrats like Joe Biden are calling for stricter gun laws, including an assault weapons ban, but Republicans have kind of just scoffed at that suggestion, instead putting forth all the usual arguments that this is a mental health problem, that, that freedom is more important, that the school should have just had security. With Tennessee lawmaker Tim Burchett claiming laws don't work to curb gun violence and saying, we want to legislate evil, it's just not going to happen. And then there was a lot of attention on Andrew Tate today because there was a lot of online chatter, a number of supporters saying, hey, this time his appeal, it feels like it's going to be different. It feels like he may actually get out of Romanian custody. Custody. And as far as the reason, you had some pointing to the Tate brothers attorney claiming that the U.S. Embassy in Romania has taken an interest in their case, though that remains right now unconfirmed. But the big update today is that, yes, it was a different day, but it was the same shit, with Andrew Tate losing yet another appeal for bail and having to remain in Romanian prison. Whereas you have Andrew Tate, his brother Tristan, and the two women still detained. And so with this news today, it means that Andrew Tate will remain in custody until at least April 21st. And these dates are becoming more and more significant because, remember, this is the fourth 30-day extension. They were arrested back in December, and they can continue to be detained, but only for so long. Because if nothing changes, the latest these extensions can go is through the end of June. Because remember, while they were arrested as part of a rape, human trafficking, and organized crime investigation, they have not been charged with anything yet. So for now, we're gonna have to wait to see if that changes anytime soon. And then in entertainment news, we've got big updates and accusations regarding that whole creator clash mess we talked about earlier this week. Right, so where we had left off was creator and fighter Froggy Fresh had been dropped from the card. And for many, this seemed like an abrupt move by the organizers of the event. There was some backlash and speculation, some wondering if this had something to do with Froggy Fresh's beef with I-Dubs' wife and uh, Anissa 
Lisa and her mom, with people of course wanting to know more details and specifics here, all of which seemingly leading to Creator Clash releasing another statement last night saying, we want to provide some additional information around the rationale for this decision to help clarify some of the online chatter, and saying, we have a legally binding code of conduct that each of our Creator Clash 2 fighters are held to, the violation of which is grounds for termination, and adding, unfortunately, there were several violations made by Froggy Fresh during his tenure with Creator Clash this year, and going on to claim they made several unsuccessful attempts to address them directly with Froggy Fresh in the hopes we could work together to get things back on track, and adding, when it became clear that the exhibited behavior wasn't stopping at risk to the other fighters, fans, and others involved in the event, the Creator Clash 2 team made the collective decision to move forward without Froggy Fresh on the ticket. Also regarding money being donated to Froggy Fresh's charity or not, it went on to say Creator Clash and IDubs have already donated $50,000 for each of Froggy Fresh's supported charities, Kids Cancer Foundation and Nick Lost Children's Hospital for a total of $100,000, and saying they will also remain beneficiaries of money raised throughout the event itself. In closing, the fighters have all been working so hard and can't wait to get into the ring. Let's focus on their fights, not any that may exist online. But with all this, we saw Froggy Fresh shooting back in statements of his own in a series of tweets, asking who tried to reach out to me several times and what are the several violations, and then asking if this had to do with his ties to Sam Hyde, who's a highly controversial personality, with some including the likes of Hassan Piker describing him as an anti-Semitic troll and an alt-right Nazi. Are you ever gonna accept Sam Hyde's fight offer? What? I don't, dude, no. Why, why are you fucking talking to me with some dumbass fucking weirdo Nazi? What's what? wrong with you? Others also pointing to and sharing clips online saying that there's history regarding what he has said about Anissa in the past. So fuck you, bitch, ho, slut, fucking slut, ugly slut. There's nothing worse than a slut who's ugly. I'll bust your teeth out, bitch. And Froggy adding, Are you talking about when Ian called me the third time ever, 15 minutes after Sam Hyde retweeted me, to investigate my friendship with Sam Hyde, and then asking that I don't release any content with Sam Hyde until after the event? Haven't released any Sam Hyde content. Still kick? Froggy Fresh also saying that he always responded to messages from Justin Tracy, who outlets like Dick Zerto identified as a member of staff, with him then doubling down and reiterating, I was never given any notice of violations. I got one email minutes before you went public about my termination. Justin Tracy called me while I was in Providence working with Sam. I asked that he could text or email email me as I was busy training with Sam. He never texted or emailed. The men later claiming one of the biggest things here that he had been threatened with a lawsuit for speaking about this, saying the threat of being pursued legally unless I remain quiet and let them tarnish my reputation to where no one else would want to work with me for my misconduct is rough. I appreciate the donation to the charities I submitted and continuing to keep donations coming into them. I don't want CC2 to fail. I would rather we just walk away amicably where I'm not threatened. Though on that front, we saw another creator by the name of Mudahar say he would actually cover the expenses that Froggy Fresh would incur here, saying threatening litigation like this kind of worries me, but I hate it when smaller creators have to face any legal crap. It ruins lives. I'm down to cover it all. No need for GoFundMes. I just want this to be resolved. I want a successful event at the end of the day. But ultimately, that's where we are with the story right now. And I don't know if it if it ends here and it just kind of lingers or if there will be further updates. I sent out a request for comment to Ian to see, you know, are the lawsuit allegations correct? Has a lawsuit actually been threatened uh, with what Froggy Fresh is saying? Like, is there any validity to that? But in the meantime, let me know your thoughts on this. And then we live in a world right now where there are a lot of people telling Elon Musk to go fuck himself because he wants like seven or eight dollars from him. There are also apparently people that are willing to give him a hundred thousand dollars. And I don't mean the, the Saudis helping him buy Twitter. Rather, I'm talking about people like this principal at a high-end charter school in Florida who turned in a resignation to the school board last night. And that because she sent a check for one hundred thousand dollars of school funds to a scammer posing as Elon Musk. To make matters worse and even more embarrassing, the principal had reportedly been speaking with this person for months despite the repeated warnings from her staff that it was a scam. But for her, the, the offer was too appealing. With Elon promising to invest millions of dollars back into the school with just a small upfront cost on their part. Now, here's the good news. While she did send the money, the school's business administrator noticed and was able to cancel the check before it was cashed. Though everything did bring us to last night when many of the staff at the school threatened to quit if she stayed, saying that even outside of this incident, she has created a toxic work environment. In business news, we need to slow it down with the fucking robots. I'm fast as fuck, boy. That is what 1,100 top technology experts are saying about AI right now, with a warning coming as an open letter signed by the likes of Elon Musk, very nice of him to take a break from ruining Twitter to sign this. Also, Steve Wozniak and asking all AI labs to immediately pause for at least six months and going on to warn that these AI are becoming as good, if not better than humans in many tasks and went to ask, should we let machines flood our information channels with propaganda and untruth? Should we automate away all the jobs, including the fulfilling ones? Should we develop non-human minds that might eventually outnumber, outsmart, obsolete, and replace us? And also warning that the answers for these questions should not come from the people building the AIs right now, as they're currently locked in an AI arms race to build even more powerful machines without considering the implications. Now for their part, 
AI firms like OpenAI have said that they have considered all these implications and spent upwards of six months ensuring the safety of their AIs before launching. But with that, you have people saying, okay, it's great that you're trying to mitigate the risk of Skynet. But rather, what about the more down to earth things such as how our society is structured? But, I mean, recently we've seen the likes of Goldman Sachs warning that hundreds of millions of jobs worldwide are on the verge of becoming obsolete with just the AI tech that we've seen right now. Because remember, because I'll continue to beat this dead horse on camera for you, the state of AI today is the worst it will ever be ever again. And while initially as someone that's been kind of fucking around with it a little bit, it's like, it's re like a really helpful tool. It really does seem all but inevitable that the human element just slows things down. Though, if anything, all of this could also be used as an argument for why we're gonna need universal basic income. Or what happens in a world where humans don't have to do something to survive. Like, understand, we're talking about the prospect of society at its core changing in a way that it's never, ever, ever really changed before. Like, throughout History, 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 history. We are, we are standing and look, 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 looking out from the edge of a cliff right now. And then, you know, longtime viewers of the PDS know I love repping my favorite games and films. Well, what better way to do that than with today's sponsor, Pinfinity, the first and only augmented reality pin company. Pinfinity offers thoughtfully crafted, exclusively designed collectible pins enhanced with augmented reality to reveal a variety of content like music, animation, downloadables, and much more. And at pins.ar slash DeFranco, you can see some of my favorite officially licensed products like their new Dead Island 2 pin sets or the sick champion edition from one of my favorite games growing up, Street Fighter. And I love that I can collect my favorite fighters and share the nostalgia through AR with the kids. I mean, my favorite's still Blanca. But there's also something for everyone. I mean, the Magic the Gathering collections are beautiful and the perfect gift for that collector, friend, or family member. Plus, whether you're a hardcore collector yourself or just curious to discover something new, you'll want to try Pinfinity Plus to get new, exclusively themed pins every other month. I mean, join now and get three awesome Mega Man X pins or for the real MTG fan, there's a Pinfinity Plus subscription for that too. So head to pins.ar slash DeFranco. Check out some of my favorite pins today and start your own unique collection. That's pins.ar slash DeFranco. Oh, and if you're a business or a creator interested in developing your own AR pins, just check below for more info. And then this is Linda Bluestein. She's a 74 year old grandmother from Connecticut. She's married with two kids, 45 and 47, and she has several grandchildren, but she's also facing her third bout of cancer, diagnosed with late stage fallopian tube cancer two years ago. She's also currently undergoing chemotherapy, but she's also looking into her options in case the chemo stops working, with her specifically looking at Vermont's Patient Choice at End of Life Act, which allows patients to administer a lethal dose of medication with medical assistance. But not just anyone gets access to this. Vermont requires the patient to be at least 18 years old with a terminal condition, have a prognosis of less than six months to live. Also, they need to have the ability to self-administer the medication. But also, another key requirement is that you must be a resident of Vermont to qualify. And as a resident of Connecticut, Linda wasn't able to access the procedure, so she was prepared to move to Vermont away from her family if necessary. But then, Compassion and Choice is an advocacy group for expanding access to end-of-life medication helped Linda file a lawsuit, with her main argument being that the residency requirement is actually unconstitutional and a senior staff attorney with the group saying, to my knowledge, other than what's happening right now with abortion, there are no other medical procedures that are limited to people on the basis of their residency. And arguing it's just unfair and it doesn't really make sense to restrict some sort of medical practice just based on zip code or residency. What we ended up saying was actually surprising. The state ended up settling, waiving the requirement for Linda should she decide to pursue the procedure. But also the even bigger news connected to the story is it doesn't appear that the state is going to stop with Linda, with them now reportedly considering doing away with the residency requirement altogether, which would be a pretty big deal because of the 10 states in DC that allow some patients with terminal illnesses to seek end-of-life medication, Oregon's the only one that doesn't have a residency requirement. And even that change only happened last year because of a lawsuit. And so in Vermont specifically, the House actually passed an amendment to remove the residency requirement. It's currently in the Senate, so we're gonna have to see what happens there. But also notably, not everyone's on board, where there's some that argue that it isn't a medical procedure at all, with the director of the Robert Powell Center for Medical Ethics saying, this is a medical professional abandoning their patient and giving them the tools to end their life. And that's in addition to other major opponents, including disability rights activists, with them citing the concern that this could highlight or even exacerbate the inequities in our healthcare system. And one saying there's just no place for it, especially when we have such a long history of racial disparities in healthcare and disability discrimination in healthcare. But with all that said, going back to Linda, should her chemo stop working, she says that she plans on ending the treatment altogether, with that then making her eligible for hospice, and that's when she would pursue the procedure in Vermont. They're planning on spending her last days surrounded by family and going through 50 years of photographs together and sharing memories. With all that, I want to pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts here? Because as far as me, when it comes to end-of-life medication, especially if someone's terminal, I'm personally on board. I mean, I, I do think that, of course, there do need to be restrictions and safety nets. But if you've ever seen a terminal person and their quality of life is, it's just, they're just living in pain. It seems a horrendous and maybe even accidentally evil thing to force them to live with it. Even with how scary and heartbreaking the, the prospect of ending a life is. And then, the FDA just approved an over-the-counter 
or overdose antidote. Right? I mean, the opioid epidemic has resulted in hundreds of thousands of deaths by overdose, with more than 106,000 people dying from an opioid overdose in 2021 alone. And now, Narcan, the nasal spray version of naloxone, which reverses overdoses, was just approved by the FDA to be sold over the counter without a prescription. But the FDA is saying in a statement regarding the decision that the choice was made in order to improve access to naloxone and reduce the number of opioid overdose deaths. But there are also some concerns here. If pharmacies were already allowed to distribute Narcan to anyone who requested it under law, and the cost for Narcan was free for those with Medicaid or private insurance with maybe a copay of $10. But many public and private insurance agencies do not cover most over-the-counter drugs, meaning that people have to pay higher prices for Narcan, thus making it less accessible than the FDA intends. Though the FDA did acknowledge this concern, with the FDA in their statement pushing other producers of prescription versions of naloxone to apply for over-the-counter approval in order to make the prices competitive. But whatever the price point ends up being, by the end of summer, Narcan will be widely available in grocery stores, gas stations, and all sorts of other establishments. And in international news, the UK's intelligence service just hiked up the terror threat in Northern Ireland to severe. That is the second highest ranking in, means an attack is very likely. And according to Northern Ireland secretary, the reason for the terror level increase was because, quote, in recent months, we have seen an increase in levels of activity relating to Northern Ireland related terrorism, which has targeted police officers serving their communities and also put at risk the lives of children and other members of the public. Now, even with all that, the British authorities don't want people in Northern Ireland to panic. Right? If violence happens, they reportedly don't expect it to be nearly on the scale it was before the Good Friday peace agreement. But the group's expected to carry this out, being fringe, break-off groups of Republican radicals that have done pot shots at security forces for years now. It's also why the security level has been one rung below severe for over a year now. I mean, hell, just last month, an officer was shot and barely survived with life-changing injuries. Also, to be clear here, you know, I know I have a majority American audience. Uh, these are different Republicans. They also love guns and Jesus. But the main gripe is not wanting to be controlled by the British crown and Protestantism. The timing here is is also key as the region's coming up on celebrating 25 years since the overwhelmingly successful Good Friday Agreement that ended decades of violence between the Republican groups and the Crown. But if you're watching from Northern Ireland, Keep an eye out, be safe. Also in other news, Ireland not the only place that's not a fan of the Brits. So this time, it's the city of Amsterdam, with Amsterdam launching an ad campaign targeting young British men to tell them to stay away, which apparently is not reverse psychology. It's just a simple message. They don't want British men aged 18 to 35 coming on over. Because reportedly in Amsterdam, they have this reputation of being kind of drunken fools who start fights going around naked and pee in public. The issue's actually been going on for so long that about a decade ago, Amsterdam's then mayor invited then London mayor Boris Johnson to see what Brits get up to, saying, the Brits don't wear a coat as they slide them through the red light district. They sing, you'll never walk alone. They are dressed as rabbits or priests, and sometimes they are not dressed at all. I'd love to invite him to witness it. And you have some saying this latest step is just part of a campaign and a long history of trying to clean up the city's reputation as this crazy party city. Which of that, I would say, I mean, Amsterdam is gorgeous. It's an amazing time. I love it. But for a lot of other people, the, the things that come to mind when you think of Amsterdam are, oh, drugs are widely available and prostitution is legal. Which I guess is why the, the way this campaign is working is by placing digital ads when people in Britain search up things like stag party or pub crawl Amsterdam. And it'll feature videos of drunk people getting arrested instead of having fun, with the message clearly being, your shenanigans have clear consequences. That said, this campaign is controversial, with some disgusted by it saying it's discriminatory and it targets a group solely based on stereotypes. And other locals saying they don't think it's a specific group that's a problem, but rather than just the sheer number of people that are showing up. And so that's why, of course, I'd love to know everyone's thoughts, but specifically, if you are a Brit or if you are Dutch, let me know your thoughts. What are you thinking about this? And then we might be seeing one of the biggest business shakeups in a while right now. Alibaba, an absolutely massive Chinese company, announced that it's breaking up into six different distinct companies. News that has caused the stock to absolutely soar, which it also sorely needed because for a while now it's been in the gutter amid a crackdown by Chinese authorities. I mean, it had dropped nearly 70% since 2020. And it sure as hell didn't help that its founder, Jack Ma, was under scrutiny by the CCP. But recently, China has seemingly changed its course and vowed to ease its crackdown and support private businesses. So what we're seeing are these changes will make most of the spinoff groups almost completely independent, with the current CEO saying that Alibaba Group plans to shift to a holding company management model. This all also coincides with Ma's return to China itself, with many seeing it as a clear sign that the government is serious about not wanting to crack down on business. But also, this is the CCP we're talking about here, so uh, we'll see. With that, I want to say thank you for being a part of another daily dive into the news. My name is Philip DeFranco. I love yo faces, and I'll see you tomorrow.